Hello and welcome to this Astranti training video. And in this series of videos, we're getting you prepared for your ACCA Strategic Business Leader exam for the March 2024 sitting. And as you can see from the screen in front of you, today we are analysing the industry of which Athletic Transcentral, the football club, finds itself. So in this video, we're going to take you through our industry analysis pack going, or that starts with, I should say, the history of football, the football as a product, who Athletic Transcentral's customers are, marketing, the operations, the football supply chain, the tech that's involved in the football industry, HR, stakeholders, ethical issues, corporate social responsibility, the key competitors that Athletic Transcentral are going to be facing, as well as any others, and legal and economic and industry stats. So as you can see, we're going to go through quite a lot in today's video. And what we're going to do as we go through is pick out all the relevant informations to make sure that you feel prepared and confident for your exam. Now, before we actually get to the crux of the content, I do just want to spend a few minutes talking about why you should actually... Uh, sit down and watch today's video, which is going to be running for about an hour. And we're going to do this by going through chapter one, how to use this analysis. Now, one of the words you'll quite quickly see picked out in this paragraph is one that I've already used. Because ACCA tell us that you, as strategic business leader candidates, don't need to focus on in-depth research of the industry of your pre -scene. So why are we asking you to sit down now and take an hour of your revision time looking at that? And that ties back to the word I used, confidence. Because what we want you to do is to feel like you're a native in the industry. So that when you come to take your exam, you're coming into that exam with an air of confidence. You are gonna be more prepared for the types of scenarios that are gonna be thrown at you in the tasks. Now, in your exam, you're gonna be expected to provide very applied, logical business advice as though you were an industry native. So if you know the types of issues in the real world and the types of real world decisions that companies equivalent to Athletic Transcentral and people in your position are making, well then suddenly it makes sense, doesn't it? That your responses in the exam are going to be better. Because producing a logical, well-rounded report is going to be key to passing this exam. So in this industry analysis, we've scoured the web, we've scoured journals, we've read magazines for the most relevant information connected to the pre-scene industry. So, so I'm not going to ask you to re-watch this video many, many times. Just one hour spent watching this video is going to give you that baseline knowledge so you feel like you know the industry. So I feel like this is a really positive way for you to be spending an hour of your revision time. Okay, so that's why you're doing this. Let's get going and actually do it. And we're starting with history of football. Now, history in some form or other has been knocking around in England for hundreds of years but the game we know now originated in the late 19th century. The English FA, which was the sport's first governing body, was formed in 1863. So that's when the rules of football began to become formalised and really set the foundations of the industry that we know now. Now, I mentioned that football's been played in some form or, or, or other pardon me, for hundreds of years. We still have a game in a town in Derbyshire that's played, I think, on Shrove Tuesday, just before Easter, where two sides of the town, you play on what side of the town you live, get a ball, and one goal is on one side of the town, 
one goals on the other, and everyone tries to get their ball from one side of the town to the other through fair means or foul. A lot of fighting exists. And that's the kind of various forms of soccer that I'm talking about. And eventually, the game we have now uh, came from that. But of course, it's a much more structured game. Um, I mentioned the game that we know now starting in the kind of the late 19th century. This is when a lot of the clubs that we now have in the English League started to be formed. Um, you might have noticed if you watched the other videos in this series, I talk about Leeds a lot. Leeds, uh, Leeds United, I should say, was set up in 1892. But there was a Leeds club behind then. So you can see that these clubs that we have in England have a long heritage and a history. And of course, it wasn't long before... These clubs began to be set up in other parts of the world. And soon the National Leagues and uh, the professional game was started. Uh, the, the English Football League was founded in 1888 and football became an Olympic sport in the 1900s. The growth of football, or the fan bases and commercialisation, followed the World Wars. Because then we began to see the start of the World Cup in 1930. And what became the Champions League began to be set up in 1955. Globalisation and technological advances in the late 20th century and early 21st century transformed football into a significant global industry. And Sky uh, began broadcasting the English Football League in 1992. And that's really when we see a huge change in the commercial success for English football, driven by these big, uh, expensive television rights clubs, suddenly we're getting vast amounts of income and, of course, global audiences. And so merchandising increased and sponsorship increased. And then the appeal has just continued to grow and grow and grow. And major international competitions are attracting massive global audiences. So we know that football is now a very, or well, an old industry. Let's have a look at the in industry life cycle. Well, I've already mentioned, haven't I, that the game began in the late 19th century, the game as we know it. It began to grow in the early 20th century, rapid growth. Oh, pardon me, I've gotten really off the line there. Uh, the formation of national leagues, professionalism, international competitions. And then by the late 20th century, talking 1990s, football reached its maturity stage, stable growth in fan bases, established leagues, and significant commercial revenues. And then satellite TV has further globalised the sport, increasing its reach and financial clout. So for example, when I lived in the Middle East, be quite common if you were waiting somewhere like a bank or in any other kind of business and had a TV in the lobby, you'd see Premier League football. You'd be, see Spanish First Division football. Really is a global game. And then the final stage in the industry life cycle, we have decline. But of course, by decline, we've put a question mark. Now, we've seen in our pre seen some leagues, we talked about really in the videos, some leagues, some clubs are facing challenges, but there's still a massive global interest in football with emerging markets like I've just talked about, digital media platforms and new forms of fan engagement. And so actually I would say it's unlikely that football has reached a decline phase yet. Okay, so let's look at another element now of professional football that came out from the pre-scene, and that's women's football. So women have been playing football for a long time now but it's really only recently that we've seen uh kind of growth in the women's game the kind of professionalization of the women's game so now we're starting to see uh, major interest in international tournaments uh increasing viewing in professional leagues the professionalization of the game basically with greater investment and you can see actually that kind of seems to mirror how the men's game went now it'd be interesting to see if it can 
reach the same heights as the man's game. And of course, that does uh, pose interest for Athletic Transcentral because they're very successful. They've got a very successful women's team. So if the the women's game did start to mirror the men's game in terms of sponsorship and viewership, obviously that's really could be a really lucrative avenue for Athletic Transcentral Transcentral, pardon me, to pursue. Okay. So let's just quick uh, look back to the pre-scene again and see how what we've just talked about applies, if anything I've not mentioned. Well, they, we know that Athletic Transcentral had a long history, 1895, with traditional team colours, so it's got a strong brand identity and a loyal fan base. And something we talked about time and time again whilst going through the pre-scene is this is really significant because this is a really powerful marketing tool which can be leveraged to enhance brand loyalty and attract sponsorship deals. Okay, so let's move on to our second section now, which is products. So we've got a list here of different product types. So for example, we start with ticket sales and then in the description of what they are. So with ticket sales, obviously clubs sell um, tickets for their matches and they can be either individually. So a fan can buy a one-off ticket or they can purchase season tickets, which lets them uh, go to see all the home games. Um because obviously they also sell tickets to the away fa- fans. Um, so a stadium, I don't know, let's say easily for mass has got 40,000 capacity. Well then, at a game, you're probably looking around the thirty to 35,000 mark are gonna be home fans. And then there'll be an allocation, the remainder, for the away fans as well. So fans, teams, sorry, normally have traveling support. Then we've got match day revenue. So here we're talking about things that you sell inside the stadium. So people come to the match, they're gonna buy a drink, they're gonna eat some food, they might buy a program of the game. They might pay a bit extra to have a really special match day experience where a formal football player uh, talks to them about their experiences or guides them around the stadium. There's hospitality boxes. So a hospitality box, perhaps a company might hire a whole hospitality box, which maybe can take, I don't know, 16, 20 people. And then they can invite clients or valued employees to come along and have a drink and watch the game. Um, So that's some more uh, product type, match day revenue. Second one is transfer fees. So when a player or team sells a player to another club, then the selling club receives a transfer fee. So if you're a club, that's got a strong youth academy or a scouting network where you can buy the players cheaper when they're younger. Then you hone them into a much better player Then you can sell them for a lot of money. Well, this can really generate substantial incomes by developing and selling players. And a lot of clubs do do that. If they can't compete financially if their backers don't have huge amounts of money like we see at clubs like Manchester City or Newcastle, which teams are owned by states. Well, then another way for teams to compete is to think, well, okay, we can sell players to those teams. And to do that, obviously, they have to kind of almost farm the players. Another uh, product type is advertising commercial sponsorship. Where's my marker gone? Here we go. So here you might be selling advertising space around the the perimeter of the pitch. You might be selling uh, a brand name onto a kit or you may agree partnership deals for digital content or community programs, naming rights for stadiums and training grounds. Really, there's many, many ways that club have commercial sponsorship now. Um, And you see football branding kind of in every sphere. And then another type is club merchandise. So this is when you sell products associated with the club. 
This famous one is replica kits, so you can dress up like your favourite players, but it can be anything from earphones to socks to luggage. I mean, really, any kind of merchandise can have the team's brand on it. But of course, then there is fakes out there and clubs will have to work to combat counterfeit merchandise to protect their brand and revenue. Event hosting is another way that clubs can monetize themselves. So it's when football stadiums are used for other sorts of events. Because remember, if there's 18 games in a season, well, you're only used for 18, 18 days in a year. So what else could that huge stadium be used for that occupies prime real estate that can take huge numbers of people? Well, then maybe used as venues for events concerts or other sports uh, a lot of grounds now also have rugby games uh, places like Wembley and Tottenham Hotspur's new stadium they also put on NFL games um, so yeah really in whatever way they can be used they try to be used because obviously during the off season they're not used for anything at all television income is huge as we saw in the pre-scene Deals with broadcasters for the rights to show matches are major sources of revenue, but some clubs also operate their own TV channels, generating revenue through subscriptions, advertising, and sponsorships. So an important point to notice here. Okay, we talked about Sky's uh, sponsorship of British football earlier on. And they still do, but they also share that sponsorship with, I think at the moment it's TNT, but I might be wrong with that. Um, well, it's important to note that's, that's in Britain. Okay, but what about fans in America? That's covered by another broadcasting deal. And what about fans in Australia? Well, that's another broadcasting deal. And what about fans in other countries in Europe? That's another broadcasting deal. And also what you do see, if clubs do have their own TV channels, they may not be allowed to show the English games because of the deal they've signed with uh, the British broadcaster but it doesn't stop them selling rights to their own games through the rest of the world. So they're getting the money directly to the fans to watch the games, just not in their home country. Uh, new products being introduced, digital content and social media. So clubs are monetizing their online content for exclusive membership offers and fans get to access premium digital content. So maybe the training and the uh, press conferences by the manager. I know if you're... Uh, not a football fan, you think, why are people wanting to see the press conference? I'll tell you something very sad about myself. Uh, when we had our manager, Marcelo Bielsa, who couldn't speak English, I would still watch the press conferences in Spanish, even though I can't speak Spanish. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It makes you sound like a maniac, doesn't it? Okay. Um, another way you can uh, get products is international tours and pre-season tournaments. Now, I read something today. I think it was Liverpool and Manchester uh, United are having a pre-scene or pre-scene tournament in America uh, in 2024 in the summer. And fans are paying between $115 and $500 to watch the training sessions, not the games, the training sessions. And apparently they're almost already sold out and what we're in February and this isn't until the summer. So this shows you there's big markets out there. Esports and digital gaming is another one that we talked about in the pre-scene. Uh, many clubs have entered the esports arena either by sponsoring players or teams in football-related video game tournaments or by developing their own branded games and apps. So this is appealing to a different demographic, maybe a younger tech-savvy audience. They're trying to entice to the game so this audience isn't lured away by substitutes away from football into other entertainment arenas. Okay, so let's, uh, one more thing, fan tokens and cryptocurrency. So something that's been done recently, the creation of digital fan tokens, offering holders the chance to vote on minor club decisions, access exclusive content and participate in fan experiences. Now this is fans kind of, exp oh, sorry, clubs, sorry, exploring new blockchain technology for fan engagement and revenue generation. You see that with a lot of clubs. I'm getting a lot of emails from Leeds talking about uh, their blockchain opportunity, which meant you could do things like uh, vote on uh, who was the man of the match. You could 
have various degree or varying degrees, I should say, of influence in some kind of minute way. It was kind of a way to get buy-in. Um, and now we look onto the product ranges of competitors. So the range of products a club can offer can significantly influence its competitive position, brand value and financial health. This is really important to strategic development and marketing among football clubs is deeply influenced by the position within the football hierarchy, their legacy, their demographic and the psychographic characteristics of their fan base. So we've got your top tier clubs, first of all, top tier clubs play in the highest leagues, competitions, they have extensive and diverse product ranges. All the things we've talked about really are kind of what you'd expect from top tier clubs. With the lower tier clubs, those outside the top tiers of the football leagues, where well, they're focusing on products that resonate with their local and regional communities. So maybe affordable match day tickets or community oriented programs, merchandise celebrating the club's regional identity. So they, these clubs have got far more limited resources. They're not getting the TV money. They're not getting nearly the size of crowds. And so the sponsorship's not as big as the top tier clubs. So the product strategies are closely aligned with their core fan base, fostering loyalty and support at the grassroots level. In terms of trends, sustainability is the first trend I want to look at. So this obviously ties in with a broader societal shift and not only helps clubs reduce their environmental impact, but also strengthens their brand amongst consumers. So maybe merchandise that's made from recycled or sustainable materials, some of the eco-friendly kits, uh, adopting sustainable operations, reducing plastic use in stadiums, implementing energy efficient lighting and water conservation systems. So just some examples of offsetting carbon emissions from team travel and also think about all the supporters travel as well if you're taking thousands of fans around the country what's a sustainable way in doing that how can clubs help another trend is digitalization so this is all about enhancing the fans experience and opening new revenue streams so we've got things like streaming services so fans can watch the games digital membership cards so these can be can offer convenience and can be integrated with loyalty programs so fans pardon me can access the games more easily get discounts on merchandise as well as access exclusive content and ar apps and virtual reality are increasingly being developed to allow fans to come closer to the action maybe so you can view games in different angles stadium tours or meet favorite players another trend is personalization again we're personalizing merchandise we're leveraging data analytics so fans can be offered personalized communication and promotions and of course then you can get things such as personalized greetings from players bespoke tours and customized match day experiences so personalization is all about making sure clubs deepen their connection with fans. Globalization is another trend. I mentioned this already. Clubs are now really aware of their position in the international markets. So you might want to create content in languages that represent that and increase or expand, pardon me, your online stores to offer international shipping and develop products suitable for that particular geographic area. And you may want to utilize social media platforms so you can reach that global audience with targeted content. Well, how does this apply to the pre-scene? Well, we know that Athletic Transcentral, Transcentral pardon me, enjoys a typically diverse stream of, stream of revenue sources like the top tier clubs do. There's an outdated stadium that's operating at full capacity, which is highlighting the need for modernization in order to boost that match day revenue and improve fan experiences with a focus of incorporating technology and sustainability. It doesn't have a lead sponsor, but it does have a diverse portfolio of commercial sponsorships and the club's direct sale of trademarked official replica kits illustrates a commitment to brand integrity but its online sales range is rather restricted at the moment okay now we can move on to our next section which is chapter three customers and marketing okay so with customers we've got the local fans people that live locally in this in uh, in the city perhaps where the stadium is global fans as the name suggests are going to be watching on satellite 
Uh, I might look at these foreign tours that I was talking about. Corporate clients, these are the people that are probably going to be buying the hospitality boxes or buying the advertising space, for example, and youth and community groups. And this is the kind of customer segment you want to foster to make sure you're not losing any fans that should be following you from a young age. So I mentioned it in the pre-scene, Leeds lost a lot of young fans in the years that we weren't competing and weren't really trying to keep hold of them. We didn't have any shops in the city selling merchandise, for example. And they would have gone off supporting other clubs, even though they lived in Leeds, probably supporting local clubs like Manchester, Sheffield, cities that are local, just like we see in the pre-scene with Athletic Transcend Troll, has no one else in the city but lots of competing clubs nearby. And then changing demands. Experience over product. Fans are looking more now for a comprehensive entertainment experience that includes pre-match, in-match and post-match activities rather than just looking at the football and being happy with that. Digital access and engagement. They want to have access to interactive platforms and content. And something you've already mentioned in terms of a societal shift, sustainability and social responsibility. Fans are increasingly expecting their clubs to adopt sustainable practices. Okay, number two in this section is marketing. Marketing mix the four Ps. Firstly, product. But well, the product here is encompassing the entire fan experience, match day experiences, merchandise, digital content, community engagement initiatives. Price, tickets, prices are often tiered based on seating location, the match importance and opponents. So for example, uh, a team uh, at Liverpool, Manchester United clash, for example, you'd be paying the most for. Um, and then obviously cup competitions, finals, you pay huge amounts for. Um, but then early on in cup competitions and cups that aren't particularly important, you'd be paying the least amount for. Uh, you also, it talks, it's very true, talking about pricing for seat quality, you can easily pay money to be in a stadium and then be sat by the pillar. Um, and you'd still be paying a fair amount of money for that, especially if the game was one that was in demand. Clubs often must balance making their products accessible to fans against the need to generate revenue, with clubs commonly offering a range of price points to cater to different segments of their fan base. However... In recent years, there's a big discussion about ticket prices just being too expensive. And certainly when you look at somewhere like the German leagues, where they're much more focused on making sure the match day's ex experience is tailored towards kind of what they would say is traditionally football fans, perhaps more working class fan base who don't traditionally have as much money. And they, they think they run a program they're called 20 is plenty, 20 quid is enough. Or oh, 20, 20 euros, I should say, would is enough for a game. But uh, prices of football matches can be into the hundreds. Uh, place is our next P for football clubs. The include This includes the stadium for match day experiences and retail outlets for merchandise. However, because we've got global fan bases now, online platforms are becoming more and more important. So here we're talking about official websites, online stores, and third-party e-commerce platforms to reach those international fans. And then promotion. And here we're not talking about going up to the Premiership from Division 1. Here we're talking about the ways clubs promote themselves. Here it can be TV and radio, social media, club websites. So a range of different promotional avenues. And here's some examples of marketing methods used by competitors. So Man United use social media for fan engagement and state-of-the-art digital streaming platforms offering exclusive content. Barcelona leverages its motto, Mesqui un club. I'm going to have uh, said that incorrectly, I'm sorry, which is more than a club to emphasize its cultural and social values. It uses dynamic ticket pricing, has a significant presence on various digital platforms to engage with its global fan base, base pardon me, and Wrexham, uh, are a Welsh club who have, I think I'm safe in saying have always been in the lower leagues have recently been acquired by Ryan Reynolds and Rob McKelney to gain international media attention. Um, they've got their own TV show now on Netflix, I think. And that's obviously it's enhanced its social media engagement 
and they've been able to revamp its digital content strategy to attract this global audience. So you can see there's a variety of ways, really dependent on the club itself. And you can see there the positioning of this uh, has come from what the club is. Barcelona, more than a club, use its cultural and social values. Wrexham FC really uh, makes use of the fact it's been acquired by celebrities to differentiate itself. So we know in the pre-scene... 80's got a strong foundation within the football industry in Carland. has got a broad spectrum of stakeholders. However, it does need to maximise its digital engagement strategies and tap into modern trends such as the sports and personalised content that are currently underdeveloped. By enhancing its digital platforms, 80 can meet the increasing demand for on-demand access and tailored experience. And we've talked about how by... Increasing the capacity of its stadium, there could be a bigger shop. That means it could expand its merchandise offerings and improve its shopping experience. Uh, and we have already noted in this video about the women's team success and how that offers another avenue for marketing and fan engagement. And by celebrating the success of its women's team, AT can capitalise on the growing interest in the women's football, drawing new fans and sponsors, interest in gender equality and the development of the sport, as well as an interest in the female game, really. It doesn't have to be just because it's about gender equality. Uh, okay, now we're on to chapter four, operations. So in football, there's a variety of different operational methods. So you've got event management on match days, merchandise production and sales, content creation for the digital platforms of the running of community and youth development programs. So you can see a variety of different functions there. Um, now we, we talked about in the pre-scene about how event management how it could be difficult if events football games aren't managed well we saw at Wembley the last international tournament fans invading the stadium we just had a Carabao Cup final in England again Liverpool fans complained that they were stuck outside at the beginning of the game so ticketing systems are really important as is security protocols then, of course, you have all the other aspects of it, making sure there's enough food, making sure there's enough customer service, all that thing. It's a huge undertaking. And, of course, there's merchandise production, content production, and community and youth programs. Now, of course, we've also got to have someone to play the football and the coaches managers, trainers, and all those other support staff that go into putting the team onto the pitch. So skills needed. We've got a range of different skills. So for those in digital content creation, we're talking about technical skills. They're going to need editing and video production example. But for staff, coaches, they might need to understand data analytics so they can tell players how to progress the best. Operational logistical skill. Obviously, if you're in event management, you're going to need those to make sure you're handling the supply chain okay. Customer service skills from frontline staff, coaching and development skills we've talked about. And you might need some football skills if you're going to have a football team as well, might you? You're going to need a skilled team of footballers. And then number two, the supply chain. So we've got key supplies to the industry. Well, you've got your stadium equipment. Uh, sorry, your sporting equipment, I should say your stadium supplies, your merchandise, and your tech uh, and software. So we might see key suppliers in the real world be people like Nike and Adidas supporting equipment and the sportswear, Cisco for network infrastructure, IBM for data analytics when we're talking about technology providers. You can have facility management companies organizing the stadium maintenance, the security services, etc., and then you can have merchandise suppliers and distributors. Number three, tech. So we've kind of mentioned different aspects of tech. We can have a number of range of technologies in football, performance analysis tools, fan engagement platforms, and stadium techs. You know, we need things like Wi-Fi in the stadiums, cashless payment options, um, AI and machine learning, so clubs are beginning to use this more for things like predicting player industries and personalizing marketing messages. Blockchain, we've talked about. Data analytics platforms, making sure smart decisions are made, uh, using things for targeted marketing campaigns. Now, in terms of internal systems, 
with enterprise resource planning. Well, these systems integrate all facets and operation, planning, purchasing, inventory sales, marketing, finance, human resources. That's going to help clubs management manage pardon me, their operations more efficiently. CRM, customer relationship management, are vital for managing interactions with current and potential fans, enhancing customer service and executed targeting marketed strategies. Finance and accounting software, inventory management systems, and then we can turn our ideas or our thoughts on online issues where we, we know we've got things like the website, but of course that also means cyber security is of paramount concern, protecting their fans' data. Social media is something we've talked about already, how important it is. We saw that with Man United. It's a chance to communicate with fans, especially those global fan base. We can use it for promotional campaigns, brand building, and crisis communication. So the application for the pre-scene, we know AT is going to be using lots of these methods and technologies I've just talked about, but we, not a lot specified in the pre-scene document itself. And AT supports can be composed of experts in all the areas I've talked about. And we did note that their training facilities are state of the art. So it suggests that all that tech in the facility is likely to be very high tech. So performance analysis tools, AI, machine learning, and advanced training equipment are going to help the team hopefully improve their performances on the pitch. So we can move now on to number five, stakeholders and CSR. So firstly, we're going to be looking at staff and human resources. And firstly, key staff. Now we've seen already, haven't we? We're aware we're going to have a vast array of staff carrying out a vast array of different jobs on and off the pitch. So on-field roles, we've got our players, our coaching staff, our medical team, making sure our players are fit, and our performance analysts making sure that, well, they're the ones that are analysing the data, seeing how well the team are actually performing uh, away from just the scoreline. There's lots of different metrics teams can be analysed by. Just because a team loses a game doesn't mean they weren't the best team. Uh... Lots of things can happen in football, so it's a bit more complex than just trusting the scoreline tells you the best team. I would say that as a Leeds fan, I guess. Uh, moving away from on-field roles now, looking at admin, we've got the club management, human resources, finance team, as you'd expect from a normal organisation, really. Marketing commercials, so we've got the marketing team, commercial team, merchandising team, again, Everything you would expect from an organisation that carries out all the, that has the products and the roles we've already talked about. And then we've talked about operations just in the section before, stadium management, match day staff, event coordinators. And then of course you've got media and communication, so the press office, content creators, and technology and IT. You can have IT staff and data analysts doing all the roles we've already talked about. So you can see... A vast array of roles and responsibilities before you even get to the Youth Academy. So again, doing what the first team coaches do, but at a younger level. So they might be younger coaches themselves, you know, learning their own skills before they try to get roles in the first team. And of course, you have scouts trying to find the next big thing. Not forgetting health and safety. So you've got health and safety offers making sure everything is complies with health and safety regulations across all club operations. So a huge variety of roles. So the skills needed are skills that are going to be connected to all of those roles, technical and sporting skills, business and admin skills, tech and digital skills, communication and interpersonal skills. Um, we'll go through this quite quickly because I think we've touched on all those roles and skills already. Employee power and union issues. This is something I mentioned in the pre-scene. Players often do have significant bargaining power represented by the PFA, so the Footballers' Union in the UK. And now these bodies negotiate collective bargaining agreements addressing wages, contracts, working conditions and health and safety. Other club staff may also be unionised. Depends on the country. Depends on the job roles and of course unionisation can impact wage negotiations, the working conditions and job security. So we know if we go back to Athletic Trans Central it's going to have a huge range of roles. All the ones that we've talked about uh, because they're in a professional football league and they're one of the top clubs. 
So let's move on to the stakeholders now. So this is looking at the key stakeholders in the football club shows how complex the ecosystem is in which the clubs operate. First ones are those shareholders in the stock markets. So lots of football clubs are publicly traded. So the shareholders there are investing into the club with the expectation of financial returns, influencing major decisions through their voting rights at shareholder meetings. And of course, the performance of a club on the stock market can affect its financial health. And that will in turn dictate its ability to invest in new players, infrastructure and other critical areas for growth and competitiveness. And then we have local communities, which are, of course, foundational to football clubs because they're the ones providing the fan base and the ongoing support. And of course, the clubs themselves have an impact on their local areas. They create jobs, they bring tourists into the area, businesses make a lot of money from the crowds coming to the area on match days. And as we spoke about a lot on the pre scene, clubs do a lot for their local areas in terms of outreach. I mentioned a lot in the pre scene, uh, Leeds work with the food banks and the Leeds hospitals. Governments are another stakeholder. National and local governments are key stakeholders because of their regulatory roles and the public services they provide, transportation, infrastructure, etc., etc. They also have a vested interest in the social and economic benefits sports clubs bring to their communities and, and the nation because they do things like promote health, uh, community cohesion, and of course provide international recognition if you get to that level. There's also taxation and steady development projects. There's a lot of uh, areas where government policies directly affect the industry. And then we have government environmental groups. We've already had government environmental groups. So again, that ties in something we've already talked about. The society's uh, aspect or interest in environmental issues is changing, is increasing. And so to reflect that, then um, the stakeholders in football clubs will also be expecting football clubs to make those changes. So reducing carbon footprints is one we've talked about a lot. Clubs respond by implementing more environmentally friendly operations. And the pressure and support from these environmental groups will help them work out their environmental impact. And there's other spon uh, stakeholders, sponsors and commercial partners for obvious reasons. And of course, the media, because they're the ones that broadcast the game, provide coverage and shape public perception of clubs. Sports governing bodies like FIFA, UEFA, the FA in England, govern the sports rules, organise competitions and oversee transfers, significantly impacting club operations. So it applies to the pre-scene. We know there's a dedication from our Athletic Trans Central to community and youth programmes and they commit to fostering future talent, enhance their local ties and ensure long-term fan loyalty and club sustainability. So ethical issues. So there's some that have been quite notorious in recent years, bribery and corruption. Even at the, uh, the top level, we know that... Uh, I've got to choose my words carefully here. I think that FIFA is often accused and I think often charged with uh, bribery and corruption, things such as where I think, I wonder whether I should use the term allegation, I think there's been allegations that they have chosen countries, for example, where the World Cup should be held based on uh, items they've received. I really don't know how best to phrase that. But bribery and corruption is a significant... Um, Concern, at, if it's at this significant concern at the top level, can we assume that there could be concerns throughout the game? I don't know. Um, I'm going to leave that one there. Staff treatment, I don't want to get sued on my uh, strategy video. Staff treatment is another issue. So obviously you've got lots of different staff working in lots of different roles. There have been instances where clubs or their suppliers have been found not providing safe working conditions or fair wages for the staff, especially if they're in countries with don't have particularly safe or stringent labour laws. Uh, integrity of the sport is next. The integrity has been questioned in various leagues throughout the world. Max Fitching scandals often arise, seem to be fairly synonymous with Italy. The top league in, in Italy has had real problems with this over the last 20, 25 years or so. And basically a match fix is when someone is in a position to set the match result or perhaps 
they choose to get a booking or concede a corner at a certain minute in the game. And of course, other people can bet on that before it happens. It's kind of a, a fixed event that people are going to make money from via gambling. And obviously that ruins fans' trust in the game, especially their teams at doing it, because they think, well, then what's what's my passion about if, if you're uh, not really caring about the result either? Confidentiality. Here, the unauthorised disclosure of transfer negotiations, player contracts and strategic decisions can lead to ethical concerns around confidentiality because the leaks don't only affect the involved parties' negotiation positions, but also raise questions about internal governance and data protection practices. There's environmental concerns. We talked a lot about this. Carbon emissions, for example, attached to the travel of fans and stadium energy. Um, Social responsibility, again, something we've come back to. Clubs are expected to play a significant role in their local communities. Recent actions and reforms. So because of this, the industry has seen various reforms and initiatives aimed at improving governance, transparency and social responsibility. So the implementation of stricter financial regulations, as we've seen also in this pre-scene, enhanced oversight of transfer dealings and initiatives to combat racism, promote diversity and commitments to environmental sustainability. So there we go. There is ethical considerations. So we can see in the pre-scene, Athletic Trans Central is positioned to set a positive example through transparent governance, social responsibility efforts and promoting diversity. So engage with stakeholders. Number four, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. So the top CSR issues are all around things that we've already talked about, really. Community engagement, diversity and inclusion, environmental sustainability and youth development as well as responsible business practices and health and well-being. I don't think we've touched on this. So health and well-being programs may include promoting physical activity, mental health awareness, and access to healthcare services. Clubs can also support initiatives to tackle issues such as substance abuse, addiction, and unhealthy lifestyles. And then the final element of CSR, fan engagement and social impact. So here we're talking about supporting fan-led initiatives, community outreach projects and charitable fundraising campaigns. Now, just as a real-world example of this, I am a Leeds fan. I listen to a fan-created podcast called The Square Ball and they often do fundraising for mental health charities, specifically mental, men's mental health charities. Um, they walk 92 miles in honour of uh, the former midfielder Gary Speed um, and Leeds help with that. Leeds provide the backing. Leeds, Leeds, I'm talking about Leeds the club. Leeds also raise the awareness of this. So there's this kind of um, cohesion between the two groups. So another case study of this is Barcelona and, and its foundation called FC Barcelona. Oh, I'm up here. There we go. So it's all about using sport as a tool for positive social change, embodying the club's motto, which I'm not going to butcher again, so I won't say it. And it's all about pushing forward education, violence prevention and social inclusion through football and other sports. Key initiative is Football Net, which instills values in youth across 50 countries' refugee support programmes. They use sport to aid integration of the refugees into society. Anti-bullying campaigns into school. And it partners with organisations like UNICEF and the International Paralympic Committee. And it extends its impact to health, education and disability in sports. Or disability sports, I should say. They also prioritise environmental sustainability and it's earned the charity that is global recognition, strengthened community bonds, and showcased the club's role in driving positive social change. As a privately held entity, AT enjoys operational flexibility in close stakeholder relations, but faces challenges in capital raising and valuation due to its non-public status. These dynamics, ne- these dynamics necessitate the strategic planning to navigate financial and operational hurdles, ensuring AT's continued growth and competitiveness. That's how... What we've just learned relates to AT. So we're moving on to the penultimate chapter now. And we're talking uh, about key competitors. And here's a name I might not have mentioned before. And that's um, Leeds United Football Club, who I've already told you about in the Football League. Now, I think earlier on, I might have made a mistake here. I think I told you we formed in 1892. Now, obviously... I 
I've got that totally wrong. I'm, I should be ashamed and should cut my Leeds membership card in half. I'm obviously talking about the original Leeds City. Leeds United was founded in 1919. In fact, the original Leeds uh, City was uh, disbanded because of financial irregular- irregularities. So this is something that's been happening for hundreds of years. Um, so let's have a look at their strategy. Club has focused on sustainable growth, investing in player recruitment, youth development and infrastructure improvements. The appointment of Manit Marcello Bielsa, the god, in 2018 was a key strategic move that led to Leeds United's promotion to the Premier League in 2020 after a 16-year absence. The club's strategy emphasises an attacking style of play, community engagement and building a strong fan base. That's certainly true, known for its very strong fan base, uh, its pride amongst fans. And it kind of is a self-fulfilling prophecy, really, because... If you get known for the strong fan base, it means you end up taking lots of fans around the country because they want to be part of that. Okay, um, the basis of competitive strength. Well, we focus on youth development. We have to focus on coaching and management because we can't really just go around spending money willy-nilly. There's financial fair play regulations in the first division. And because we've been relegated recently, we had to cut like a third of our... Our costs, I think, at the beginning of the season, I might be wrong, those exact numbers. So you can see we just couldn't go and buy anyone we wanted. It's all about coaching. We've had a 17-year-old playing midfield and right back this season. Just shows you the focus on youth development. Fan base and brand, as I said, robust support from a loyal and passionate local and international fan base. Certainly do. Operations. Leeds United operates a professional football club participating in domestic and occasionally European competitions. Well, it's been between decades, yeah. And uh, we, we play in Ellen Road in Leeds, which has been its home since its foundation. Very much like Athletic Trans Central Stadium. About 38,000 capacity needs to be modernised. We've uh, recently had new ownership and the focus... In fact, we've had ownership changes a couple of times in the last seven years. And the focus has always been on... How are we going to develop this stadium to make use of this really passionate fan base? Because we could get much more in the 30-odd thousand that we can fit in there. Uh, Leeds United operates through a structured organisation encompassing football operations, including player recruitment, training and match day management, commercial op- operations, sponsorships, merchandise sales and community engagement initiatives, marketing Leeds employs a multifaceted marketing approach to reach its market and engage with fans, traditional media channels, social media platforms, where it actively engages with fans globally. We've got lots of fans in Norway and Australia. that We've always ha- had fans there from, but also in Japan and America, as well as community outreach programs. The club's marketing success is evidenced by its strong brand presence, significant growth in global followers and partnership with leading brands. Okay, so let's move down to its revenue now. In 2022, it's almost 190 million, up from around 170 million in 2021. So a big increase here. Um, a big increase because you can see here gate receipts uh, in this period are significantly down. Now, why might that be, you ask? Well, if you look at the dates, you'll know that that was the pandemic. So this was the era of COVID where fans weren't allowed to stay in the stadium. I think from about March 2020 to December, there was no fans allowed in the stadium. In fact, it had been, I think the football started again in June. I I mean, I can't quite remember, but it's around that time period. In December, they were allowed back in the stadium. Then restrictions came back in and out again. And you can see the what um, impact that had on gate receipts, and also then the knock-on to things like catering income. So you can see how important stadium and match day revenue are. Of course, we've got television and broadcasting income here. Um, Now, more games were shown on TV because of COVID, but this also marks the season that leads to a promoter to a new deal, which should have been more lucrative but also teams get paid more the more times they're on TV. Now, when they were in the old championship in this division here in these figures, they were shown, most of their games were shown because they were one of the bigger teams in that league. But once they get promoted, suddenly there's teams competing for the title, uh, teams that have been around in the Premier League longer, so they're getting shown more. So they're not getting as much per game. So there we go. There's a quick look at revenue. Now we'll just drop down to player salaries. You can see here full-time playing staff, 
53 members of staff, apprentices dropped slightly in 2022, football team management increased, management administration 146, casual match day staff jumped up 745, but again, we're looking at COVID figures in on this, in the 2021 section. Um, and then the aggregate payroll, you can see a jump in the payroll to 120 million in 2022. Okay. Now let's have a look at the earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. They made an operating loss of 35 million in 2022. So, in terms of cash flow, Leeds had a net decrease uh, in cash in 2022 of approximately 25 million pounds. Well, we can now go down to player sales and purchases. We can see in 2022, 250,844,689 pounds. So we're dealing in huge figures here. Capital expenditure. So we're in here, we're talking about long-term investments in long-term assets. So stadium upgrades, training facilities, player acquisitions, things like that. So let's have a look. Tangible assets. We've got leasehold land and buildings, alterations and improvements, fixtures, fittings, and equipment. Now... You can see here alterations and improvement, huge amount of money. Again, going up a league meant we had to alter the stadiums in some way to make us fit in with the regulations of the Premier League as we were coming from a different regulatory body in the Championship. So you can see how it does have a definite impact, the regulatory bodies. And uh, are the competitors, um, unfortunately for, for Leeds, so there's... The top three competitors in the UK football industry. Well, I would I would suggest that Man United are not one of the top three competitors in the UK football industry. But for for ease of use, let's just agree they are. So they're one of the most storied and successful clubs in England. They're focusing on leveraging its global brand for commercial revenue, investing in high-profile player transfers, strong global brand presence, commercial deals based at Old Trafford. Marketing, they have a glo global marketing strategy, strong social media presence, numerous sponsorship deals and international tours. Financial performance, they've not done too well on the pitch in recent years, unfortunately. Oh, poor Man United. But they continue to report strong revenue, largely due to commercial and sponsorship deals. And the fact they've just had a very large investment, uh, formerly owned by the Glazers. Um, they've now had a new group invest with them. And it's valued them, I can't remember off the top of my head, but a huge valuation is put on them. And they're trying to get back to the top of English and European football by investing in player transfers. Well, let's hope that doesn't work. Liverpool, very rich history in English football. Smart recruitment, developed players, strong attacking style of play under the manager Jurgen Klopp, who's leaving at the end of the season. All about team ethos, strong management and effective player development. Based at Anfield, uh, focused on expanding the stadium and enhancing the match day revenue. Huge marketing, strong engagement with the fans, digital platforms, social media, global merchandise sales. Significant re revenue growth in recent years because they've won the Premier League, they've won the Champions League. So not only have they got the prize money and the TV broadcasting money, obviously it raises their profile globally and they're attracting more fans and then the more fans spend money and then they get more money they can invest in more players and it becomes a snowball effect and then man city someone who in recent years uh they had lots of trials and tribulations but uh had lots of investments from uh a state so really have just been able to buy their way to success from significant investment from its owners Invested in world-class playing talent, infrastructure, and expanding the club's global brand. Interestingly, actually, their infrastructure spreads city-wide. They've invested a lot in Manchester itself. I think they've got the old Commonwealth Stadium ground, which they've made some additions to. It's not one of the biggest grounds in the, in the country, and they don't often fill it, even with even with their success, because uh, unlike maybe Liverpool, where it's kind of you see this team ethos, it's getting the, the brand and the city around it, and with its success, it grows. Here, the success has kind of come top down, really. They've just bought the success in. But they have a huge football academy. So they aren't just buying top transfers. They are spending millions globally on young players. For instance, they have just bought a 15-year-old from Leeds for a million pounds. 
Now, that 15-year-old has not been near Leeds' first team. It's just all about potential. And there'll be add-ons to that. So let's say, for example, he does make a first-team appearance and he might never do for City. Then they'll probably play Leeds X amount of money. If he plays for his country, they'll probably play Leeds X amount of money. Now, what they do do is probably loan them out to their other stable of clubs, which I mentioned in a previous video. The owners have bought other clubs. so They can loan them to those t those teams in less competitive leagues. They can have exposure to football. If they get good enough, they'll play for City. If they don't quite get good enough, but the professionals, they'll be sold to other teams. And it's a way for Man City to become a little bit more sufficient. Although I should say, I think they're facing 155 might be 115 charges uh, against financial fair play. So we're waiting to see what happens there. They could face really heavy sanctions. Um, okay, marketing, recent activity, d dominance in the Premier League, can't argue with that, and strategic global expansion through the City Football Group. group. And really there, actually, probably the City Football Group is the biggest indicator of how global football is now. The fact that it owns a multitude of stable football clubs over the, all over the world. And uh, its scouting network is all over the world as well. Okay, new competitors in market dynamics. Clubs like Leicester City and Wolverhampton Wanderers, Wonder, well, Wolverhampton Wanderers have emerged as competitive forces, challenging the traditional elite with smart recruitment and innovative strategies. Well, Leicester City won the Premier League in, I want to say, 2016, but I might be wrong. My dates aren't great. Um, and they were considered heavy outsiders. Didn't nearly have the investment that the traditional top four have. They won the league against all odds. They've now spent significant amounts of money on a state-of-the-art training facility, but like Leeds are no longer in the Premier Division. So it goes to show just this investment in the academy, trying to bring these players through, doesn't always go to work. And Wolverhampton Wanderers uh, had a difficult, different kind of um, rise from the championship to the premiership where they now are. They were bought by a football agent, a very well-known football agent, and he was able to bring his players to the club at reduced rates, players who were far too good to be playing at the club at that time. And they quickly got promotion, uh, and that's and that's what they did. Not found it so easy since being in, in the Premiership. Okay, uh, in Syria, Atlanta. Atalanta, sorry, has challenged traditional Italian giants through a focus on youth development and an attractive uh, style of play. They've recently played in the Champions League. And since its founding in 2009 and rapid ascent through the German Football League system, Red Bull Leipzig, Leipzig sorry, has become a top contender in the Bundesliga, the German First Division, powered by strategic investments and a strong youth academy. Red Bull, um, the Red Bull stable, I should say, are another one that have a similar policy to Manchester City. They operate a number of clubs, such as um, an Austrian Red Bull, in different countries, and there's a lot of uh, relational links between the two. They can loan players and buy players from each other, etc., etc. And recent mergers and acquisitions: Newcastle United were taken over by a Saudi Arabian consortium. Um, now, previously, when clubs have been taken over by huge wealth, like with Man City, we saw them suddenly buy all these huge stars for tens of millions of pounds. But financial fair play rules have since come in. Since City, I should say. And it means that clubs can no longer spend more than they generate. So just because you've got an incredibly rich benefactor doesn't mean you can use that money. You have to be sufficient. AC uh, Milan and Inter Milan, two very fierce rivals in Italy, are playing for New Shed Stadium. They do share one at the moment, but um, they're playing a new one together, which goes to show there's an operational strategy uh, which can... Uh, succeed over rivalry and at the takeover by Qatar Sports Investments in 2011 transformed PSG into one of the wealthiest and most successful clubs in Europe impacting the competitive balance in League One and Europe. League One is the French top division which I think they've won a number of times since that point. Now of course by them winning a number of times it means other clubs don't. It means other clubs don't get that prize money it means they find it harder to compete and eventually there becomes a bit more of a uh, dominance by one or two clubs. Okay, competitive strategies and recent failures. Arsenal's failure to qualify for the Champions League in recent seasons highlights the competitive nature of the Premier League and the financial implications of on-pitch performance. I talked about Leeds United's failure to qualify for the Champions League in the early 2000s. It meant that we couldn't afford our players anymore. We bet on reaching these. We've, we'd budgeted for reaching the Champions League. We didn't make it. We didn't get the money from it. We had to sell our players. 
and we went in the top division again for another 16 years. FC Barcelona has combined financial clout with renowned youth academy. However, financial mismanagement has recently led to significant debts impacting their ability to compete at the highest level. And after years of dominance, AC Milan faced financial difficulties and a decline in performance, failing to qualify for the Champions League for several seasons. Recent strategic changes have begun to reverse this trend slightly. Okay, so... Athletic Transfer and Tell can gain valuable insights by examining the strategies of clubs like Atalanta and RB Leipzig, highlighting the significance of innovative recruitment and youth development in building a competitive team without heavy financial outlay. Uh, similarly, the global brand expansion tactics employed by giants like Manchester United underscore the potential of digital platforms and international tools in tapping into new markets and revenue streams. And the transformative effects of strategic financial moves exemplified by PSG's takeover suggest AT could benefit from exploiting strategic partnerships and investments. So there we go. That's how it relates back. And now we can look at industry issues, legal framework. So we've got employment law. We've already talked about the number of different roles we have at the club. Uh, so an organisation has all the normal contracts and employment laws it has to be aware of. But there's also in football, the players themselves, the players' contracts are slightly different from other contracts. They can include image rights and performance-related bonuses, which add another layer of complexity. Health and safety regulations, making sure players and spectators are safe is paramount. So they could have stadium safety certificate certifications, for instance. Data protection laws, we talked about that in the pre-scene, GDPR, obviously they're collecting large amounts of fans and personal data, it's important they keep it safe. Industry regulations, we talked about a lot, so financial fair play, we don't need to mention it again. Transfer regulations, there's a body that monitors transfer regulations, which players, uh, teams can appeal to. So for instance, Leeds bought a player a couple of years ago during covid he got injured, so we didn't use him. He's a loan to buy. So we're going to loan him. And then if he completed X amount of games, we'd have to buy him. A mandatory fixed fee of 15 million or so pounds. I think this is from Red Bull Leipzig too. But because of COVID, actually the dates of the season got messed around. And Leeds tried to say, actually, we don't have to pay you because the dates weren't, his football games weren't completed by these dates. Now Leipzig said, well, hold on a minute. That doesn't matter. And they had to appeal it. And it went through, it took a year or two. Um, before Leeds had to finally stump up. So that went through the regulatory bodies. There's national ones, European ones, then then finally an international one. And anti-doping rules. Obviously, football players shouldn't be taking in, in performance. There we go, enhancing drugs. Industry bodies and their roles. FIFA, the world governing body. UEFA, the same but in Europe. CONMEBOL are the same but in South America. Political importance. We've already spoken about how important it is for cities that they have clubs well the same thing for nations world cups european championships infrastructure just thinking the world cup how many fans come to a country because of it and a country's prestige is raised by having it uh, oil is another thing we've highlighted here and we're here specifically oil wealth now i've mentioned a few teams that have been bought by states that have enabled to invest huge amounts of money in football. Now, a lot of this debate has centred around the fact that these clubs are doing it to sport wash. So basically, they're buying these clubs to divert attention away from any practices that people may not find particularly appealing and to associate themselves with good time football instead. So this has increased infrastructure development and all these kind of things which are really positive, but also they do raise ethical and environmental questions. Changing legislation, well, football always mean football is always changing legislation. So, for example, the rise of online betting has led to increased regulation around sports betting in order to prevent match fixing and protect vulnerable individuals. So, legal and regulatory challenges significantly affect AT's financial and operational strategies, employment law, etc. etc. Okay, let's scoot down here because we've talked a lot about those issues. Economic and industry stats. Well, I mentioned in the pre-scene, obviously, the effect of recession on the football market means fans have less disposable income. However, I would say that fans are fanatical and actually probably it's the last bit of disposable income they would keep um, because it's, it's more than a product. It's um, something that it really is life and death. Clubs may need to adjust their pricing strategies to enhance fan engagement. You often see at lower T levels they have 
a free free games once a season. I think there's a non in non league football. I think the whole non league structure has a turn up and support your team for free, and then obviously hopefully you spend money at the ground. Impact of EU and other trading groups. So here we we've talked about how TV broadcasting issues can change from one country to another, but also you've got to think about work permits and taxes because you've got clubs dealing internationally and all clubs and nations and trading blocks have different regulations. Changes in tax laws, so VAT can impact clubs by altering the cost of tickets and merchandise for consumers. So obviously, if there's a increase in VAT, then the clubs may need to increase their product or absorb the cost themselves. Similarly, with interest rates, uh, they impact clubs, particularly regarding debt financing and investment. Obviously, lower interest rates reduce the cost of borrowing, for example. Exchange rate issues, well, obviously, you've got clubs dealing internationally with each other. So, obviously, any uh, exchange rate issues will impact on that. Market prices uh, will impact the operational costs for clubs. So, talking travel expenses and energy costs for stadium operations. And market overview. So the global football industry has seen significant growth over the past decades. We've seen that, haven't we, with increasing sponsorship and commercial revenues. We've noted the digital transformation in the industry, trying to engage this, this new demographic, making sure they stay engaged. And emerging markets have had a profound impact on the global football industry's market share. Countries like China, United States and India have become key targets for expansion because of their large populations and their growing interest in football. And we can relate all those instances back to AT quite quick, easily, because they're all quite general football examples I've already given. And AT is no different to any of the examples that I've just given in those circumstances. So there we go. That is the end of the industry pack. I hope you found it interesting. I think we probably just got over an hour there, so my apologies. Shouldn't have spoken about Leeds, always makes me witter on a little bit too long. But hopefully you now can go in there feeling like a football expert and feeling really confident in your exam. Thanks so much for watching. So I hope you found all these videos really useful and I hope you feel really confident and informed before you head into the exams. But I should stress, it's not enough just to know the theory. It's really important that you know that you can apply your knowledge in exam situations. And in order to make sure that you pass first time, you need to make sure you can handle the situation. You need to make sure you can handle the questions in those exam situations. So what we've done at Astranti is to help you prepare. And we've done that by creating two challenging ACCA strategic business leader mocks which we've based on the latest pre-scene. So as you can see our two mocks are going to test your knowledge of the syllabus. Remember ACCA can test any part of the syllabus they want. It's going to highlight any weaknesses that you feel that you then need to go on and revise. So maybe they'll actually didn't know this area too well. That's an area I need to improve on before I hit the exam. So it's really useful in showing you your weaknesses. It's also going to make sure that you understand the time limits before you get into the exam because you'll have practiced in exam conditions. You'll have practiced to the time limit. So your time management is going to be better if you do these mock exams before you do your actual exam. It's also going to provide you, pardon me, with in-depth solutions. So maybe you think, well, actually, I'm not sure what I've done wrong there, but our solutions will guide you. Our solutions will show you exactly where to improve. And finally, our two mocks are designed to replicate the exam. So you're going to go into the exam not only feeling confident, but you know the setup. You've done a couple of the exams, and you're going to have had that crucial exam practice. So there we go two mock exams that I definitely recommend that you take before sitting your strategic business leader exam. So good luck with the rest of your revision and good luck with your exam.